On September the 17th, 1986, the teen sitcom Head of the Class first premiered on ABC. The series was a twist on older legacy sitcoms of the decade before, specifically Welcome Back, Cotter, which had featured a soft-hearted teacher taking over a class of slow-witted delinquents while finding promise in each of them and teaching them to find personal ambition. Head of the Class sought to be the subversive polar opposite of this cliché. In the series, substitute teacher Charlie Moore finds himself permanently taking over a study period at Millard Fillmore High, a class which openly exists solely so the smartest kids at school can study for their academic team. However, Mr. Moore finds the group to be pompous, asocial, and lacking in any real teen experiences. They don't go on dates, don't do school events, and basically they're all so dedicated to academics that they have no lives. He suggests that they have a lot of developing to do, especially when it comes to Janice Lazaretto, a 10-year-old who skipped several grades and is considered the smartest student in the class. Would you like to see it now? In a minute. But you're cutting into our time, Mr. Moore. Janice, you're only 10 years old. Time is all you've got. Mr. Moore encourages them to commit to living normal teenage lives while he attempts to teach them anyways. He shows them that an ability to memorize and recite facts does not match his actual real-world experience, as he was actually present at many of the historical events he discusses in the classroom. I'm going to read these over the weekend, and Monday we start with the Chicago demonstrations. Aren't they referred to as the Chicago riots? What we were demonstrating, a large number of people in uniform were rioting. <laughs> Mr. Moore has a tendency to begin his lessons on tangents which seem totally meaningless at first, before eventually revealing them to be an essential part of understanding a lesson or piece of the wider story. His talents as a speaker are proven time and time again by his ability to get a class of know-it-alls who think they have nothing left to learn to listen endlessly to his long stories. But Moore is not without his limitations. He had previously moved to the coast after high school in order to pursue a profession in the theater, but his hopes and ambitions had been crushed. Throughout the series, he has to occasionally juggle his insistence that the kids can do whatever they seek to achieve with his own failure to live out that promise. In several memorable episodes, he also helps the students put on famous plays, essentially acting as if he were the school's theater teacher. Head of the Class ran for five long seasons, despite being set in a high school and supposedly starring upperclassmen. By the end of the show, most of the cast were between 25 to 30, and all were still role-playing as if they were 17-year-olds. And as I'm sure you can imagine, with a cast of 11 leads who were not consistent for the entire run of the show, it wasn't uncommon for the writers to shuffle the deck in terms of who was being matched with whom for either romantic subplots or comedic banter. But very quickly, two characters became paired up with extreme consistency. Arvid Engen and Dennis Blunden. Arvid is a mathematician, a bookworm, and someone who's in love with a popular girl at school and does not hide it. I'm, I'm smart and funny looking. It's a deadly combination. <laughs> Albert Einstein, smart and funny looking, right? Marilyn Monroe said that he was the sexiest man she ever met. Unfortunately, Marilyn Monroe is no longer in the dating pool. <laughs> While Dennis is a cynical yet excitable prankster, obsessed with technology and the impact it might leave on future generations. I'm not stupid. I know why I'm overweight. It's anxiety. <laughs> As a future physicist, I, I'm on a collision course with destiny. <laughs> They're probably going to use me to create some sort of super weapon to annihilate mankind, and I won't be able to stop it. Both become quickly known for their flippant attitude, often leading to swordplay and disagreements. And great physical comedy is derived from the fact that, to put it bluntly, Dennis is very large and Arvid is very thin. But despite how they might disagree, the pair always seem to make up because they are brothers in some way. Dennis is infamous for quite a few things in the show, 
He borrows money recklessly and never pays it back. He lies without need and gets caught in massive drama because of it. And he often has to deal with the repercussions of his various pranks or comedy material not landing quite right. You don't think it's funny? I'm not laughing, Dennis. You see, that's the difference between you and me. I take the existentialist point of view. Life is a joke. Do you know about existentialism? No, Dennis, I just got here from Mars. You want to play funny philosophy? Do you know Dante's The Divine Comedy? Because Dante says there are nine levels of hell. That's a comedy? <laughs> Several other important stories include the one where Dennis gets a job working at a diner to help pay back the money he owes all his friends, the double-length event episode where the entire class gets to go overseas for a big competition, and the episode where Dennis tries to get his classmate Maria to help him write an essay for a big scholarship fund only for their plans to get held up by Maria's new boyfriend, Chuck. When you really think about it, uh... Dennis, life is short. Mm. And can we be honest? We are on this planet to party. <laughs> I don't think Nietzsche could have said it better. <laughs> Chuck, in simple words, is an idiot. He's a complete buffoon with no standing and no future, and he's played by the exact person you think he is. Look, Maria, I don't know. But I'm getting a little worried here that you, you have more interest for your schoolwork than you do in the old Chuck dog here. No, that's not true. Chuck isn't interested in dating a girl who is more intelligent than him, someone who's interested in books and learning rather than having fun and partying, and so Maria begins faking being stupid whenever he's around. Dennis uses this to his advantage, taking her name off of their award-winning paper while using the excuse that he's doing this to stop Chuck from finding out how smart she is. Eventually, Maria decides that she can't keep lying about who she really is, and she she reveals the truth, causing Chuck to break up with her. Now, two other notable characters who survive to the end of the series are Simone, played by Christine Hage, and Eric, played by Brian Robbins. Watch this. 30 August of 1980. Ozzy Osbourne eats his first rat on stage. <laughs> That's why you're not on the team, Eric. I'm not on the team because I don't want to be on the team. Eric is the bad boy of Millard Fillmore High, the delinquent who wants nothing to do with this preppy class of nerds or their academic team. However, testing has proven that he has a gifted mind, and his mother forces him to stay in the class to better himself. Simone is quite the different story. She's quiet, reserved, shy, and kind. She's obsessed with poetry, able to recite certain pieces from memory, and is a natural romantic at heart. Throughout the series, Eric and Simone start a turid romance, constantly dating, breaking up, reconciling, becoming friends, before dating again and starting it all over. This cycle was disrupted during an important event story in Season 4, when Simone and Dennis instead began dating. In the episode, we learn that the class had recently taken a field trip to the Statue of Liberty, only for the ship to rock and Simone to be knocked overboard into the bay, completely unconscious. Dennis had then hopped overboard to save her from drowning. In the episode, she begins dating him to show her appreciation for him saving her life. This is something Dennis feels indulgent about before he develops a bad feeling about the whole thing. Oh no, Dennis, I really like you. Hmm, I don't feel right about it. I mean, uh, what if I hadn't saved your life? I mean, what then? But you did. <laughs> Dennis, two days ago, you put your life at risk to save another's. How can I not like that? Mm. Oh, it's the ultimate test of honor, of decency, of goodness. Face it, Dennis, you're good. Yeah. Dennis eventually admits that she only nearly drowned because he accidentally hit her on the head with a life preserver while trying to rescue her, causing her to become enraged that she let things get as far as them dating for something so stupid. But despite this, thanks to Mr. Moore, they're able to end the episode on relatively good terms. By most accounts, Dennis Blunden was not the most groundbreaking character 
in the history of sitcoms. If you look around at other shows from the same decade, you're likely to find a lot of other scheming funny guys acting out of selfish gain before learning a lesson that they won't retain. But perhaps the most notable thing about Head of the Class and this character was the actor behind it all a young 20-something by the name Daniel Schneider. Although it's important to say that this wasn't the first role that Daniel had in the entertainment industry. Years before the sitcom started, he had appeared in a long string of random bit roles, which included an infamous sex comedy film. That being 1985's Hot Resort. Now remember, our motto here at the Royal St. Kitts is, the guest is always right. If he calls you an asshole, then you're an asshole. Weren't you in a movie with Fay Ray? <laughs> I don't suppose you'd like to go to the movies tonight. <laughs> Fuck off. Well, I guess a blowjob would really be out of the question then. You. Fuck me. Well, that's kind of what I had in mind. You know, which way do you like it? Because I got the People's Almanac, and it lists the six most favorite popular positions with women, especially women like you. I can tell because you have that kind of body. Have you been with a woman? Yes. But it was indisputably head of the class, which gave Schneider the connections and momentum to begin a long-term career in Hollywood. In 1988, Schneider and his co-star, Brian Robbins, were invited to co-host what most would call the very first Nickelodeon Kids' Choice Awards. It was this brief gig, performed in front of a live audience at Universal Studios Hollywood, that would totally change the trajectory of both men's lives. The award show was produced by a man named Albie Hecht who soon formed a close friendship with both Schneider and Robbins. Hecht would eventually become the head of production at Nickelodeon, and would in turn invite his friends to come work on Nickelodeon productions. However, the pair had to turn such invitations down, as head of the class was an ABC project, meaning they were obligated to that network until their contracts expired. Luckily for them, that exact situation would come just three years later. After five years on ABC, the kids from head of the class finally graduate. But the ceremony you'll see on the air wasn't half again as emotional as when the actors said goodbye after taping the final show. We've been doing this for a long time, and um, it means everything to me. Um, I would like to say what a privilege and an honor it has been. I'm sorry. <laughs> Daniel Schneider's mom missed his real graduation. She showed up for this one. So this time she showed up with uh, the Dan look. I made it this time. So I've been, uh, I've been harassing her for about seven years now for not making it. Now I can't say anything. Ladies and gentlemen, the graduating class of Fillmore High School. After Head of the Class ended, Brian Robbins formed a production studio alongside Michael Tallinn, a producer and director who had been making sports documentaries as far back as 1978. In 1993, Albie Hecht invited Robbins to pitch to him a children's television series that could be produced by their new production studio to air on Nickelodeon. Robbins quickly conceived of what was essentially Saturday Night Live but for children. The series was soon given the name All That, and Schneider was brought onto the project to serve as head writer. By the end of the show's second episode, the team had struck gold. Welcome to Good Burger, home of the Good Burger. Is there anything in my nose? I don't know. In 1996, Schneider would write the pilot episode of the All That spinoff, Keenan and Kel. The show would feature another deep cut connection to Head of the Class, as Keenan's skittish boss in the series, Chris Potter, is played by the same actor that had starred as Arvid back in the 1980s. See, well, be quiet. Keenan, this is coming out of your paycheck. Now clean up these puffs pronto. And Kel, you're fired. I don't work here. Well, see to it that you don't. <laughs> 
Both Robbins and Schneider would appear in different Season 1 episodes as guest performers. But outside of this, Schneider rarely worked on Keenan and Kel, as he both retained his position as head writer of all that, and he began writing his first feature film, to be directed by Brian Robbins. This was, of course, Good Burger. Along with this string of successes were some odd bumps along the way. In 1994, Schneider would deliver one of his final standalone performances when he appeared in Tanya and Nancy, The Inside Story. This was one of the first docudrama films made about the career of Tanya Harding and the assault of Nancy Kerrigan. The film aired in April 1994, less than four months from the incident in question. And in many ways, it is obviously extremely rushed together. In the film, Schneider plays Tanya's bodyguard, Sean Eckerd. Call Shane. What? Just call Shane. <laughs> listen to me, you moron. If you can't handle the job, maybe we'll just hire somebody else. Oh. Now listen to me. Okay. Are you listening? Do you want to write this down? Here's the new plan. You're going to go to Detroit on a bus. Taking a bus yeah, all the way to Detroit? I'm going to pop on down to Phoenix in all four grand. I'll put up this nice new place, mirrors on the wall. Yeah, a bus. Live with it. You tell Galuli. If he doesn't come up with the rest of my money, I'm going to break his legs. In 1998, Schneider left all that to focus his efforts on creating his very first sitcom. The series would be titled Guys Like Us and would air on the United Paramount Network, or UPN. I can't believe she cheated on me. This never happened to me before. It happens to me all the time. <laughs> yeah, but you're... you. <laughs> Guys Like Us is about Jared Harris, who has to raise his kid brother Maestro after their father decides to move to Venezuela for work. Jared often has to juggle the frustrations of maintaining a dating life in the city with the responsibilities of raising his little brother. The show was a massive flop, with consistently low ratings and a finale that never even broadcast. And so, Schneider pivoted taking over a pilot project intended for an all-that cast member named Amanda Bynes. Thus, The Amanda Show was born, starting a new era of success when it came to the works of Dan Schneider. When the series ended in 2002, Schneider helped create two different shows to succeed it. Drake and Josh, which aired on Nickelodeon, and What I Like About You, which aired on the WB. What I Like About You is about Val Tyler, who has to raise her kid sister Holly after their father decides to move to Japan for work. Holly often has to juggle the frustrations of maintaining a dating life in the city with the responsibilities of raising her teenage sister. His work on Drake and Josh would lead Schneider to create a sister show titled Zoe 101, which would give him the momentum to later create many other projects, such as Victoria, Sam and Cat, Henry Danger, and of course, iCarly. iCarly is about Spencer Shea, who has to raise his kid sister Carly after their father decides to move vaguely overseas for work. Spencer often has to juggle the frustrations of maintaining a dating life in the city with the responsibilities of raising his teenage sister. But also the internet's in there somewhere. Who can forget such classic original episodes as the story where Sam begins working at a fast food place to help pay back the money she owes all her friends? The double-length event episode where the entire gang gets to go overseas for a big competition? The episode where Carly begins dating a boy who is smart and tries to hide the fact that she's stupid and he ends up breaking up with her when he finds out the truth. Or the episode where Carly starts dating Freddy after he saves her life, something he feels indulgent about before he develops a bad feeling about the whole thing. Dan Schneider's work was exceptional because he didn't need to study sitcom culture. He had lived sitcom culture. He knew the tropes like the back of his hand, when to borrow ideas from old classics, and when to satirize and subvert. Sure, it's wholesome and endearing when the teacher with a failed background in theater is a wise mentor beyond his years. But what if instead, he was just insane and borderline a threat to everyone around him? Sure, usually you expect characters like Dennis Blunden, fueled by selfish schemes, will learn a lesson and get their comeuppance, but sometimes it's fun if 
every character is Dennis, and there is no lesson, and there is only chaos. 30 years after the premiere of all that, the impact the series had on the careers of everyone involved is impossible to deny. Today, Brian Robbins, the same man who was once the edgy bad boy on Head of the Class, who hosted the first Nickelodeon Kids' Choice Awards, produced all that, Keenan and Kel, and directed Norbit, is the CEO of Paramount Pictures and Nickelodeon. In many respects, Brian Robbins has become Paramount's own Lorne Michaels, with his influence and impact through his producing credits being almost immeasurable. And this ongoing power that he still wields in the industry highlights a certain awkward absence. In just under 25 years at the network, Dan Schneider became arguably one of the most influential voices in children's entertainment, alongside being one of the most successful sitcom creators of that entire decade. And he's also a person that we don't talk about. This has caused one of the most contentious discrepancies in Nickelodeon history. Dan Schneider's work is almost universally loved by contemporary audiences. You might not like every Schneider's project to ever release, but for nearly every single one, every single thing that he worked on, you can find someone from the time who will call it the greatest thing to ever be put out by Nickelodeon. However, Schneider is not exactly someone with a clean record, and so people have essentially begun to divorce him from his own content. And the reason is that doing this is one of the only ways that we can go on thinking so highly of a huge chunk of material from our childhoods. It's a lot harder to rewatch The Good Burger Movie or any classic episodes of Zoe 101 or iCarly or Victorious if they just remind you of the rather disastrous allegations which have since been made against the man behind it all. And so, we don't talk about Dan Schneider, we don't speak his name, we don't remember his face, and we don't think of his creations as coming from anywhere, having any source. Unless there's a problem with one of these projects, something infamous that we're not fond of. In that case, we're all far too ready to shake our fists in the air and take his name in vain. But as I discovered, the further we get into Schneider's output, the harder it becomes to forget that he exists. To not look at his properties through the lens of something created by him is to deny them their actual content. And all to just keep up this lie that the library of Dan Schneider still works in the modern decade, when, in many ways, that arguably isn't always the case. And so today, I'm going to break the only rule of analyzing the NSU. I am going to talk about... Dan Schneider. So when I started working on this miniseries back in 2020, there were a lot of things that I could not have anticipated. Now, I always wanted to end the series with a conversation about this topic. I wanted to end things right here. But a lot has changed. We have a lot more information than we used to. But the main thing is that this has all become a lot more personal to me. And I don't mean personal in the sense that it's serious now and it wasn't serious before. I mean that I often feel like I have become trapped in the gravitational force of the collapsing star that is Dan Schneider. Because of that, the video I'm going to make today is explicitly not the video I would have made in 2021. And additionally, I think it's very important that we start things off by laying down some very basic ground rules. These rules are very important to me, and I think a lot of people are going to disagree with my rules. 
but I decided to set some base standards and these are the stipulations that I have come up with. Rule number one. I don't want to get sued. This rule will influence all of my other rules. Rule number two. I will only be discussing claims and allegations which have an actual source. Things that are on the record, that have been said in interviews, in articles, in books, in documentaries. If it comes from an anonymous source giving tips to a TikTok creator or some forum post on a shady website, no. I'm sorry, but no, absolutely not. Rule number three, and this is the big one, if someone insists that they did not experience abuse on these sets or with any of these people, I'm not going to call them liars, I'm not going to accuse them of having Stockholm Syndrome, and I'm not going to put them on blast for that. And if someone thinks that they aren't a part of the overarching narrative of abuse at Nickelodeon, I'm not going to include their story in this video. I've been keeping my ear to the ground about this conversation for a while now, and I found a lot of the discourse kind of frustrating privately, and the main reason is that in recent years, this topic has really been picked up by true crime YouTube. Which is a polite way of saying that people are making shit up for fun. Because in the true crime podcast scene, it is common to exaggerate, speculate, fill in the blanks a little. Hey, if this one thing is true, who knows what might else be true? I mean, there's no way to really say. And whenever I've been vocally frustrated about this in public, I sometimes get a little bit of pushback, and people sometimes accuse me of defending Dan Schneider. And they say to me, hey, this is a bad guy. This is an awful guy. So why are you questioning these rumors about him? Because the truth matters. And I would love to change that, but it's above my pay grade. And that doesn't stop being a reality just because it is more interesting to just treat truths and untruths as equally valid in the realm of discourse. And if you force me to sit here and go through a hundred rumors with no source about things that people believe Dan Schneider might have done, all that accomplishes is it devalues the actual list of things that he very much almost certainly did do. And that list is not a list of good things. So I would prefer to focus on the stuff that has evidence. And with that, I am going to jump right into where I think we need to start off. Part 1. Dan Schneider, The Brand So far in this video, we have discussed a wide range of projects that Dan Schneider took part in over his 32 years working on television. But when it comes to shows where Dan Schneider acted as a proper showrunner, he is most associated with nine programs. All That, The Amanda Show, Drake and Josh, Zoe 101, iCarly, Victoria, Sam and Cat, Henry Danger, and Game Shakers. This represents well over two decades of children's content. With this comes the reality that a a lot of children grew up with this man's productions, and a lot of people still watch these shows to this very day. This is important because of the conversation of how intertwined Dan Schneider is with his writing. I'll be tackling my opinions on this later, but in short, a lot of people have actively avoided crediting Dan Schneider for projects that they think highly of. And I think what this does is erase the very explicit brand that Schneider had successfully built up over over the 20 some odd years he was at the network. Now in many ways this was subtle and easy to miss when you were a kid. Even the most innocent stuff was borderline subliminal. But here's a quick example of what I'm talking about. In iCarly Season 2 Episode 5, I Go to Japan, we are shown the iWeb Awards and specifically we see several contestants go on the stage while the gang are stuck with security. In the background of this shot we see a woman representing the best Best online cooking show. As the gang run inside, we briefly see a clip of this woman's segment. Hey, that's enough shaking. The onions are ready for action. 
if you listened closely there, you might have heard the specific stock audio file used whenever a special cameo happens in one of these shows. So who was this woman, and why was her cameo so important? Well, this is Lisa Lillian, the owner of the online brand Hungry Girl, which was also a TV show in the early 2010s, and she is also Dan Schneider's wife. Dan Schneider is a wife guy who made a long-running joke on all of his shows of depicting his wife as one of the most famous chefs in the world, with her show being watched by characters in several different shows. In fact, when the iCarly opening sequence starts, have you ever noticed this weird stock art of a brunette woman in the corner? As a kid, I always assumed this was supposed to be Carly, but it's not. That's Dan Schneider. Schneider's wife. Specifically, it's Lisa's art sona that she uses on her website and her cookbooks. Now, an annoying trend I've found when you point out any fact about Dan Schneider is that everyone tries to read it as sounding sinister. You know, you put creepy background music behind it, you make the image black and white, and you do an invert effect, and it's like, oh, this is the most creepy thing. So I just want to be clear about this. There is nothing wrong with hiding your wife in the shows that you make. But I think it's a very interesting example of the many ways that Dan's presence is felt in these shows, even if he wasn't one of the actors. But that is, of course, ignoring that sometimes he is an actor. For instance, alongside his Keenan and Kel guest episode, he appears as Mr. Bailey in Good Burger, Mr. Oldman in The Amanda Show, as the taxi driver in the Zoe 101 semi-finale Chasing Zoe, as the Secret Service agent in the Michelle Obama iCarly episode, and in the iCarly finale, he cameos as the mechanic that Sam steals from. And in All That and The Amanda Show, he kind constantly appeared in several other guest roles, and occasionally as himself. To top this off, Schneider would do voice cameos in so many episodes of so many different shows that it is impossible to keep track of. His identifiable nasally yell can be heard in essentially every project he worked on from 1994 to 2018. <laughs> It's the Pajelli Hucho! Okay, okay, you're the ninth caller, which means you've won two tickets and backstage passes to zero gravity. Welcome, yoga people. Namaste. I wouldn't want it any other way. Macho dancing! Love me! He was also in Grand Theft Auto Vice City. But the most infamous example of the hidden references to Schneider are the subliminal ones. Referencing Dan Warp. Dan Warp is Schneider's official blog and social media brand. Here, he would post behind the scenes information and personal stories. Specifically during the era of iCarly and Victorious, Dan had begun the practice of hiding Easter eggs referencing his own brand, under the guise that this would inspire viewers to follow him online. His handle was added to the logo of Schneider's Bakery, and iCarly characters would be seen wearing such shirts as Dan Warp Tweets and Follow Dan Warp. But the issue is grander than just Schneider promoting himself. I think the bigger conversation is about Nickelodeon promoting Schneider. Growing up, it was not uncommon for Nickelodeon to broadcast segments illustrating Schneider as the genius who single-handedly created a media empire and shared universe. And why wouldn't they do this? Thanks to Schneider, they were making millions off of several iconic franchises, not to mention the international Nickelodeon stars that were created because of his work. But behind the scenes, things were never so simple. Part 2, The Case Against Dan Schneider So a lot of people tend to discuss the allegations of Dan Schneider all at once and with some vagueness. And from my experience, this is typically done to build kind of a foundation of implication. To say, hey, here's a little bit of one piece information and another piece information. Now why don't you use your imagination and kind of think about what you think might have happened, you know, kind of in the sidelines there. I hate this. 
I think it's hackneyed, unjournalistic nonsense, and I will not be taking part. That's why I think it's important that we talk about the actual specifics of what has been said, and piece by piece. So first of all, we need to discuss the disastrous work culture on these shows. When you were hired on a Dan Schneider production, there was an expectation that you work long hours and you'd be available 24-7 if anything were to come up. The average weekday work session could go from 13 to 20 hours, and most weekends were spent at Dan's house trying to workshop ideas. One specific claim made in a New York Times article is that Schneider would sometimes ask the other writers to wheel him around, literally wheel him around in his office chair from room to room so he could keep working on a laptop in between moving from place to place. Arthur Granstein, a writer on Drake and Josh, iCarly, and Victorious, made this claim to the New York Times in 2021. I will always be grateful to Dan for taking a chance on me as a rash young writer fresh out of college, and for all I learned over the next six years. Much of my experience with him was a blast. He could be generous and validating, and it was exciting to be around his talent and passion for creating entertainment. But he was also unreasonably demanding, controlling, belittling, and vindictive, with a willful disregard for boundaries or workplace appropriateness. The best example of this that we now have was on Dan's first standalone television hit, The Amanda Show. When The Amanda Show first started, the showrunners hired two women for the writer's room, Christy Stratton and Jenny Kilgan. One of the main stipulations of them being hired was that they would work for a shared fee, both of them taking home half of what a male writer would be paid at that time. On their very first day on set, Dan declared that women were incapable of being funny comedians, and he challenged the two of them to prove him wrong. The elephant in the room is that it is extremely ironic to declare that women can't be funny when you're the showrunner on a program called The Amanda Show, where the lead star is a teen female comedian, but uh, you have to remember the Amanda show wasn't actually the show Dan wanted to be making. He wanted to be making guys like us. The Amanda show was just the only option he had left. Dan was the definition of someone with improper workplace boundaries. He was often cracking jokes at the expense of others, and especially the women, and he would even show pornography on the workplace computers. While Dan attempted to present himself as just a big kid who was crafting a fun work environment, everyone quickly learned that he had a fierce temper that could change him in an instant. And when Dan walked into a room, you never knew which Dan you were going to get. And yet, Schneider was so successful and so massive at the network that many felt pleasing him was the only opportunity they had at continuing their careers. And one can only imagine that if the adults were walking on eggshells around him, the kids must have been feeling about the same. The cast members on All That and The Amanda Show were little, little kids, you know, 12 to 14 years old for the most part. And they were spending those important developmental years worrying about financially supporting their families and continuing their careers after they stopped being cute little angels. The idea of trying to overload yourself with work to maximize the profit you can make off of your own youthfulness, it is a very unhealthy idea for a little kid trying to figure things out. And if there was something in the material that these kids didn't like that made them uncomfortable, they weren't gonna go up against Schneider. Because this was the guy who decided if they got a big line, if they got a special skit, and even if they got their own spin-off. And even the parents who saw what Dan was doing and didn't like it, they were scared to go up against him because they knew that would have an effect on their children's lives. Not to mention the fact that these kids were performing grueling hours to the point that pretty much every week they were breaking child labor laws just to get that shoot in the can. And after the Amanda show, this only got worse. To quote one of Dan's main editors, and this is taken from the Investigation Discovery Quiet On Set documentary, when I worked with Dan, I felt like the bar was always being risen, and I had to reach that bar. You had to be as good or better or put more hours in or do longer things than Dan did. And we all did it. Or you got fired. 
I would be editing from 8 a.m. to midnight. You didn't eat, you didn't go to the bathroom. One day, I keeled over, and I ended up having to go to the hospital. And as I'm leaving and curled over, I could hear someone say, how is the show going to get finished? But the worst story about Schneider's activity on set was when he asked Christy Stratton to act out being sodomized while telling a story about high school. Christy followed Dan's directions, to her utter humiliation. Jenny Kilgan witnessed this herself, and recalled in the documentary, It was probably the wrongest thing I've ever seen happen to a woman in a professional environment, ever. Later, Christy and Kilgan learned that it was actually against the rules of the Writers Guild of America for two writers to split a single wage. They complained to the union, who quickly came down on Schneider. Dan called up Kilgan, screaming at her, and saying that if he found out that she was the one who sabotaged the show, she would never work for Nickelodeon or Viacom ever again. Shortly after this, Dan fired Christy and Kilgan quit weeks later. The pair were replaced by a single male writer, Stephen Malaro, the future creator of Young Sheldon and Nun Pizza Left Beef. As dinky as the series might have been, writing for a series like The Amanda Show was a huge opportunity in the industry. Which is why these stories are so disappointing. After quitting, Kilgan sued Schneider for gender discrimination, which was settled out of court. The third element we need to talk about is the proximity that Schneider had to many of his child stars. In the documentary Quiet on Set, various people from The Amanda Show recall how extremely close Schneider and Amanda were. She'd often be so close to him that they'd be borderline cuddling, and it wasn't uncommon for Schneider to receive back rubs from Amanda Bynes. This tendency for him to physically touch his child stars is present in several very infamous photos. On top of this, his reputation for asking women on set for massages, be they adults or children, is well documented by many, many sources and is one of the most clear examples of sexual harassment from Schneider going across two and a half decades, if not more. When Amanda Bynes attempted to emancipate herself from her family, Schneider sided with her. He allegedly offered her help in her court case, and even offered her a place to stay with him and Lisa. This is a very tense topic to discuss, because Amanda Bynes has a difficult relationship with her family, and I could definitely see someone making the case that if Bynes attempted to emancipate herself, Schneider supporting her could be a good thing or a bad thing, just really depending on how you look at it. As documented by several people, Dan certainly had a trend with the kids he would work with. He'd pick one person out, he'd tell them they were gonna be a star with his help, and then he'd love bomb them with praise. Until time passed, he would become more passive about his investment in them, and then he would inevitably pick out a new kid to be his next starlet. A really obvious example, if we're talking about stuff in this miniseries, is that when Victoria started, Tori was presented as this ever-perfect golden child. But then as the show went on, the later seasons became very extensively deprecating at her expense. And that's a very frustrating example of this because, of course, a lot of Victoria's fans blame Victoria Justice. And I don't really understand why, because... If it has to be said, Victoria Justice did not write the show Victorious. On top of this, Dan tended to keep the personal phone numbers of his cast members. He would often text them during off hours, as well as have dinner with them. He would even invite them all to his house for various holiday parties. Look who's here. Uh-oh, trouble. McCurdy. Trouble. Hello. Hello. Now, something I've seen a lot of people say is that because such poor boundaries were in place, something must have happened. But this is the wrong way to look at this. The correct logic is this. Something could have happened, thus there should have been better boundaries. Overwhelmingly, the hardest part about hosting a discussion about this is that so many people believe that Dan Schneider is automatically guilty of child sex abuse. And it's not just that they believe it, 
It's that they need it to be true. And I, I don't know why for the life of me. So when we talk about Dan Schneider and child abuse, please keep in mind that for the most part, we are talking about inappropriate boundaries and severe, intense emotional abuse. In her book, I'm Glad My Mom Died, Jeanette McCurdy gives extensive descriptions of how the creator was on set. According to McCurdy, if an actor got a line wrong or messed up a take, it wasn't uncommon for Schneider to go into a fit of rage, screaming in the child's face, even when we're talking about actors as young as six years old. All that cast member Angelique Bates recalled to Business Insider a similar story about Schneider yelling at her after she messed up a sketch. This caused her to run off the set crying. When she joined all that, she was 14 years old. Amanda Show cast member Raquel Lee Boileau recalled similar situations during the Quiet On Set miniseries. Dan was like a tornado. He'd come in and like... Whew, and you'd be like, wow, okay, what just happened? The set would not feel the same when he would leave because everyone was on their toes, scared. One of the most infamous examples of this was on the set of Zoe 101, as later recalled by Alexa Nicholas. When Zoe 101 was in production, it's been said that there was kind of a cool kid click that affected the atmosphere of the set. The main star of the show, Jamie Lynn Spears, was a former All That cast member and the sister of pop star Britney Spears, and essentially, everyone on set wanted to be in her good graces, including the adults. Jamie Lynn allegedly decided that she didn't like Alexa very much, and so everybody on set was kind of going back and forth as you do as a teenager, picking sides and causing a bunch of, you know, teen drama. Now, I will get flack for this, but when it comes to the discussion of who is to blame for a situation like this, I do not blame teenagers for acting like teenagers. And I'm not really interested in getting mad at an adult because when they were 14, they acted 14 but in situations like this, where there's going to be so many kids on set, I think the adults who are there have responsibilities. And it's the same responsibilities that you would expect from a teacher, or a counselor, or a principal. And I think that really influences my opinion of what happened next. So one day on the Zoe 101 set, Alexa is minding her own business when who appears around a corner, out of nowhere, but Britney Spears. Britney has been debriefed by Jamie Lynn about all the onset drama, and she has decided to put up a fight for her sister. And so she goes up to Alexa, and she starts screaming in her face until Alexa is sobbing and crying, curled up in a fetal position on the ground. Now, I've been told that Brittany actually reflects on this story in her autobiography and that she was pregnant and she really regrets it. And Brittany's relationship with Jamie Lynn is a whole other thing. So sometime later, Alexa is summoned to a chamber of executives. Her mother isn't there, but who is there is Dan Schneider. And Dan allegedly begins screaming in her face about what happened. And he yells specifically, the show's called Zoe 101, not Nicole 101. His stance is that Alexa is disposable, the show doesn't need her, and because of that, she is in the wrong for any incidents that happen on set. Alexa, again, without her mother, is left crying in a room filled with adults who only want to scream at her. After this, she tells her mother she wants to quit, and Nickelodeon lets her out of her contract. If you walk away from this video only remembering one thing that I have said about this man, let it be this. The story of Dan Schneider is the classic cautionary tale of the honorary adults and the honorary cool kid. These actors Dan was working with, they believed themselves to be grown up. They might have been 13, 14, 15, 16, but they were in that space being creative. So in their minds, they might as well have been 21 or older. And so to them, they were the same as all of these adults that they were supposed to be trusting. 
And Dan was the guy who believed himself to just be one of the kids. He was a part of the gang, and he just happened to be a bit of an old soul. And so whenever there would be one of these classic cases where it was time for Dan to step up and be the adult in the room, he wouldn't do it. I think that's one of his biggest failings when it comes just to how he interacted with kids. And it's also, incidentally, why I think a lot of these former child stars, if not most of them, are totally shocked when all this bad stuff comes out about him. Because, oh, not Dan. Not our Daniel. Couldn't be precious Daniel. The next thing is probably one of the most infamous cases that can be made against Dan Schneider. The sexualization of the kids on his shows. Now, I think this mostly falls into two main categories with a little bleed over between them. And the first is pretty much edgy jokes. This is material that the writers probably would have called jokes for the parents, gags that have a little innuendo but kids won't pick up on. One of the earliest examples of this was on The Amanda Show, where Amanda Bynes played a character called Penelope Taint, and Taint is, of course, a reference to genitalia. A lot of the other jokes are kind of defined by the fact that it's really hard to see if they were done on purpose. Even in the Quiet On Set documentary, I think they bring up a few examples where you kind of go, eh, you know. Excuse me if I don't just go down a huge list of potential innuendo in these shows because I have just become so allergic to this topic in the past few years. And the reason is so many examples people would bring up to you just aren't real. They're not real innuendo, it's just them not getting the joke, or reading into the scene wrong, or not going in with context. And I just have gotten so tired of those cases. I've also found that when it comes to stuff that is like 100% confirmed innuendo, no question about it, your mileage is going to vary about how much people care about that stuff, because half the time you'll go through all this effort and you'll explain this like, hidden sex joke, and the person you're talking to will be like, huh, that's really funny. But especially in, like, Zoe 101, iCarly, and Victorious, there are a ton of, like, risque, edgy jokes. And the thing is, I remember when I was a kid, this was the reason I first kind of noticed that the Dan Schneider brand existed, even if I didn't know what to call it. I just remember that I used to watch Zoe 101 when I was really little, and I was just shocked by how often characters in those shows would, like, talk about their boobs or they'd make jokes about puberty, or they'd just hang around in bikinis. And I thought it was so new and different and edgy and risque, and I thought it was cool. And then I grew up and I went like, oh, those jokes are, those jokes are kind of weird. Like specifically, I think it's strange to be working on a kid's show uh, with actual child stars and to write them specific jokes about their boobs and to have them deliver these jokes that were written about their boobs. I think that's a weird thing. And yet, nowadays, when I see people post about, like, their favorite Zoe 101 jokes, their favorite Victorious jokes, it's those jokes that get posted, because a lot of people still love that stuff. The second category is the explicit sexualization of teen stars. And there's, like, no humor, there's no irony, there's not a bit. It's just sexualization, and that's it. I think you can definitely make the case that this became more of a thing in the 2010s when these shows started to have older cast members and they appealed to a bit of an older teen audience. That report by Business Insider claims that Nickelodeon and Schneider would have regular disputes about the outfits that were picked out for the cast members of Victorious. In one instance, a dispute surrounded a skirt that was being worn by a 17-year-old Victoria Justice. Nickelodeon wanted it longer to be more appropriate, but Dan liked it just the length it was. Eventually, they settled on a compromise of making it just three inches longer. A pretty common consensus was that at this point in his career, Schneider might have been a little frustrated about how he was still stuck in the realm of kids' TV when he kind of wanted to make adult shows, and Victorious was kind of a way for him to experiment and push that envelope. And that especially seems true when it came to the way that he sexualized the women on that show. I think one of the most obvious examples of this is the season one episode where they get stuck in the RV, 
and they're just locked in this RV during a heat wave and they're just lounging around in, you know, bikinis, getting all sweaty and getting wet. And like I said at the time, it's a fan service episode. It is an episode for the people at home that wanted to look at that stuff. And it is very explicitly sexualization of the cast members on the show. And that's why I've always felt kind of awkward about this new culture where people are like nostalgically bragging about how victorious was their sexual awakening. That's probably what they were going for, and that's not good. I don't like that. Obviously, the crossover between sexualization and innuendo is kind of big, and, you know, there's a bunch of stuff that could fall into one or the other. In the piece by Business Insider, Daniela Monet recalls a scene where she was asked to eat a pickle while putting on lip gloss, and it seemed very obvious to her at the time that this was sexual and not appropriate for a teen audience, so she contacted Nickelodeon and suggested they not air the scene. And she was overruled, and the scene aired anyways. In Daniela's eyes, the show was mostly wholesome and funny, but these sexual moments did happen from time to time, and she personally blamed the male-dominated writer's room. She also made comments about how risque some of those outfits were, and how they weren't appropriate for teenagers. Daniela wrapped up by saying, Do I wish certain things, like, didn't have to be so sexualized? Yeah, a hundred percent. Now, I think... One of the most infamous examples of this is female characters having things sprayed in their faces. Gross! Trina! I'm not gonna flush it! According to Alexa Nicholas, when a similar scene was filmed for Zoe 101, someone in the crew commented, Haha, it's like a cum shot. Now, if someone actually said that, or it's just kind of her memory representing the energy of the room, it doesn't matter, because I think the intent is certainly there. Now, I think the final example I want to bring up of these inappropriate jokes are the various scenes in Victorious where we see adult characters interact with the teenagers and make some kind of comment about the age of consent. <laughs> So, what's your name? I'm 16. Later. Hey. Are you in college yet? Bye! This is a very common thing in those early seasons. The 17-year-old characters, played by 17-year-old actors, are constantly having adult characters, played by adult actors, comment on how hot they are. Let me see this girl who, whoa, <laughs> that is quite. And it's at this point that I feel I must remind everyone of this especially weird clip from an extended DVD edit of an episode of iCarly. Ah, oh, yeah. <laughs> That's the stuff. <sighs> Bop it around. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. like Italian food. And yeah, it's weird to name a character for a 13 year old after Taint. It's weird to write scenes for a kid show where someone shoots moisturizer into a woman's face. It's weird to put scenes in Victorious where you think Tori is going to get assaulted by a group of guys. It's weird to put jokes in Zoe 101 about the actors going through puberty. It's weird to put jokes in Victorious where the teenage characters are so hot that the adult characters are keeping track of age of consent laws. It's very, very weird. And it might not be illegal, but it's wrong. <laughs> and now that we're broaching this topic of allegedly sexual moments in the material of Dan Schneider, let's talk about the B-plot from Victoria, Season 1, Episode 12, Cat's New Boyfriend. So in the story, Robbie is hanging out with the gang when he notices Trina is surrounded by several shruggers, who worship and rub her feet in total awe. Like a cloud. It's like butter. Yeah, I know. 
Robbie asks what's up, and Trina reveals that she now has an extremely smooth foot. Robbie asks what her secret is, and she responds, fish. At the Vega household, we see Trina filling up a tank with imported puka fish. She reveals that they feed off of dead skin cells, meaning they perfectly clean the human foot of all waste. Robbie puts his feet in, and soon enough is getting this special treatment himself. Oh, oh, oh. wow. Soon, Andre is recruited into the practice, followed by Jade and Beck. Towards the end of the episode, Kat punches Tori in the face, leading them to go to the local hospital. There, they find all of their friends, suffering from severe poisoning, which is the side effect of the puka fish. But feel our feet. <laughs> yes, I realize that they can nibble away all of the... Nurses, feel these kids' feet. Everyone. <laughs> So this is kind of a third tier of the allegations made against the content produced by Dan Schneider. There is innuendo, sexualization, and then alleged fetish content. The main problem with this conversation is that this topic has been the source of so much humor that it is hard to engage with this without it seeming like a big joke. But if you look at it in the worst way possible, which most do, it's not really funny at all because it's child exploitation. Allegedly. Rule one. There's also a huge level of ambiguity with this material, which I think is the main reason it was primarily left out of the Quiet On Set documentary. But this has been a primary focus of my research ever since I started this mess. So when I was watching iCarly, I wanted to find some way to represent how overpresent this issue is in Dan Schneider's material. And so I actually kept a tally so I could come up with, an, with a number that I could then cite for this segment. And after all my research, this is the number. 28. There are 28 episodes of iCarly that do not feature some kind of weird foot thing. And to be completely transparent, the reason that number is so ridiculous is that for several seasons of the show, the feet moments would be edited into the opening sequence, so every time you start watching an episode, there it fucking is, right there, looping every single time. But if we decide that doesn't count, which is entirely valid, then the numbers play out like this. There are 97 episodes of iCarly, about 46 of those episodes have some kind of foot reference or foot joke or foot footage. Characters get their feet massaged, some get massaged with feet. Foot surgery is commonly name dropped. Oh, I forgot he's having that foot surgery on Friday. Real world kids show their feet in fan videos that are often featured. There's even a character named Sako who you could very easily claim is just one extended foot joke. Feet are so essential to the iCarly brand that in the episode where the Dingo channel rips them off, there is a foot reference on their pinboard of ideas to steal. And in I Go to Japan, the Japanese equivalent of iCarly has an obsession with gigantic hands. Now there are two different perspectives to take on this topic, and I feel it is my duty to present both of these, partially because despite these being contradictory seeming, you know, perspectives, I kind of believe both of these to some extent. It is difficult to talk about depictions of feet in children's media without first addressing the fact that we are in an unprecedented era of the average person on the planet being exposed to fetish culture on a daily basis against their will. I'm being completely serious about this. Think about this for a second. If you were suddenly, magically, in 1991, and you had the brain of someone from 1991, your average understanding 
of fetishes that you don't have, that you're not into, it would go way down. And I'm not trying to be sex negative. All I'm saying is that if you were a creative person in the 90s, it's entirely possible that you might think that, like, fart jokes are really edgy and funny. And you might write skits where you work in a bunch of fart jokes. And then, boom, 30 years later, people are accusing you of having a fart fetish. And you're like, I didn't know that was a thing back then. But now there's this huge sensitivity people have to any kind of media they see that might have a fetish if you look at it sideways. Like, oh, Junior with Arnold Schwarzenegger, that's M-Preg. The start to Harry Potter 3, that's inflation. Pac-Man, that's Vor. And to give you a specific example of what I'm talking about, I think about a year ago, a SpongeBob clip went viral because it had a foot in it. And people were saying, oh, this is disgusting. This is a foot fetish being hidden in children's programming. And when you watched it, it was very obviously just gross out humor written and made by someone who thinks that feet are kind of funny. I don't personally believe that every foot joke is a fetish thing. And that's especially true when you remember that the old Nickelodeon brand was kind of the gross out like humor that the other networks wouldn't do, you know, making jokes about farts and boogers and yes, feet and feet are gross. It's shock humor. It's supposed to be for little 12 year old kids who think that stuff is funny. And so even when it comes to iCarly, I think when I look at moments like this, I'm not here for your entertainment. <laughs> I'm a foot. Leave me alone. Oh, foot. I could see you looking at that clip and saying, well, that's just shock humor. That's just supposed to be funny. That's not a fetish thing at all. And so going into this segment, I think it's natural to kind of assign a hesitant, plausible deniability to all of this. Because sure, putting feet references and feet jokes and feet moments in almost half of the episodes of iCarly, that's weird. But an onlooker could easily say, oh yeah, that's weird, but the writers just thought it was funny. They were weird guys, you know, it's not necessarily a malicious action by itself. And I think that is arguably totally fair until we get to Sam and Cat. Because there is a tweet that was put out by the official Sam and Cat Twitter, which is for some reason still up to this very day. And I kind of view this tweet as the smoking gun. And sometimes I think that no one would have reassessed this part of Dan Schneider's content if it wasn't for this one weird tweet. Sam and Cat tomorrow, right on the bottom of your foot, take a pic and use hashtag Sam and Cat Saturday, will retweet and follow until our fingers get sore. So an appeal briefly to rule one, I don't wanna get sued, so there's things I wanna say about that tweet that I'm not going to. But what I will say with extreme precaution is that when you have been accused of putting feet fetish material into the children's programming that you make, it is extremely bad optics when someone logs into the social media account of the show you run and solicits children for photos of the bottom of their feet and then promises to follow back anyone who follows these instructions. And of course, I have to point out that Schneider is very infamous for putting out tweets on his personal account about the feet of his child stars. Pick! Carly tickles Sam's very unusual toes. If you have a moment, will you please name Sam's toes for us? Video! Would you like to see Victoria Justice pour ketchup all over her feet? Well, here you go! The toe, recently adorned with a special toe flower, belongs to the sweet and hilariously talented Miss Jeanette McCurdy. At one point, he even mentions feet while flirting with his wife. At Hungry Girl, 
Do you want to go for a drive? Do you want to go into our room and watch Too Cute? We have four on our DVR. I'll rub your feet. What the fuck is Too Cute? Oh my god. It's just a a show where they show puppies and kittens? This is what they would watch? They just put on a show that's just cute animals? Jesus. I don't know what to feel about that. And as someone who's really studied this material, I truly think that it resembles fetish content in a major way that is hard to deny. And it's not just the presence of feet. It's the focus on shots of the bottom of the foot, of kids using their feet to do tasks, videos of kids sticking their feet in their mouths or in their noses and having ketchup and slime and whatever poured onto the bottom of their feet. And the important thing is that if we do read this as fetish content, it's even worse than what we've seen so far. Because the thing about sexualizing teenagers on network television is that it was often done to appeal to the young kids watching who were going through puberty. And it wasn't a Nickelodeon exclusive thing. It wasn't good, but it wasn't something that Nickelodeon invented. But the thing about feet fetishes is that they are not typically something you imagine as being on the wavelength of the average kid, and especially not the average kid back when these shows were on the air. And if this is all a misunderstanding, if this is all just rumors and people making up claims and people not understanding these scenes, it is again very bad optics that there is a character in Victorious who seems to personify all of the worst allegations against Dan Schneider. You know, maybe I should just go. Very well. But first I'd like a foot massage. What? No, I'm not giving you a foot massage. I have embarrassing photos of you. What? What, what, what kind of embarrassing photos? They were taken from unflattering angles. During your awkward phase. Well, where are they? You'll see when I post them on my blog. No, why Why would you do that? Because you refuse to give me a foot massage. But I don't see why... <sighs> oh yeah, Christopher Kane has an obsession with feet, and he asks women on the Victoria set to give him massages, and he threatens people if he doesn't get what he wants, and he embarrasses people on his public blogs. But those are just like jokes, man. Don't don't read too far into any of that. The thing is that due to my due diligence, I took a lot of notes about this topic and I have a lot of weird clips I could show, specific examples of this, that kind of thing. But at some point, I get worried that people will think that it's funny or that I will literally be uploading like from some some vantage point just a compilation of child exploitation. So I, I don't think there's a lot more I could say about the feet thing. I guess one of the final things I have to say is that there are truly some days where I think about this and I look at some of these clips and I'm not totally completely sure that Dan Schneider does have a foot fetish because I think, I think it could be possible that he's just this really eccentric guy who just really thinks feet are the funniest thing on the planet in such an over-exaggerated way that it just comes across weird to modern audiences. But when I was watching the show, I thought this stuff was easily the most disturbing material I came across. And I think that most days, I find it impossible to believe that this stuff is 100% innocent. I think, I think this shit shouldn't have been made. I think this shit is very bad. And I guess that's the short of it. Part 4. Bad Actors on Set So when we're talking about the general work environment of some of these shows, and not just the actions of one man, 
there are a couple other people that we need to briefly talk about. Starting off with the two least severe and probably most obscure. We know now that Sam and Cat was allegedly cancelled on paper because of a sexual harassment allegation against one of the producers. We're pretty sure this wasn't Dan Schneider, but we don't know a lot of details outside of that. Secondly, we know that a writer on iCarly in his 30s started dating Jeanette McCurdy almost directly after she turned 18. But the most infamous problems came during the early years of Schneider's work, during the production of All That and its spin-off, the Amanda Show. So Jason Handy was a production assistant on these shows, and one of his main jobs was he would hang out with the kids and he would help them get from place to place, kind of take them around the set. Jason was known to be very friendly with all the kids on set, he supposedly had very positive energy, and no one really suspected him of anything. But in private, Jason Handy was a self-described pedophile. Jason would use his position on several shows, including those at Nickelodeon, to establish a form of contact with children and then attempt to isolate the children from their parents. And he would specifically not go after the main stars of the shows, but the kind of more obscure kids coming in to do guest performances for one episode, to, to stand in the back of a room as extras. He went after the kids who wanted to make it big and were looking for connections, looking for people who knew how to get them a successful career, and he took advantage of that. So he would start emailing them, texting them, writing them letters, and then he'd kind of get them out of the view of their parents, and then things would get sexual. When he was finally caught by the police, they searched his house, and they found plastic bags. And each plastic baggie was filled with letters from children and some kind of personal objects he had obtained, including, you know, little things he'd been sent in the mail and even things like underwear. And so as soon as this was found out, he was obviously removed from all these shows and he was put on trial. He had assaulted children, he had kept up illicit conversations with children, and we're talking about kids as young as six years old. The second person we need to speak of here is Brian Peck. Brian was primarily a child dialogue coach who had worked on several Nickelodeon shows. He had been in the industry for decades and had established connections with many young actors who are today quite famous. During the production of The Amanda Show, Brian Peck became interested in a teenage boy named Drake Bell. Drake at the time was being managed by his father, who initially did not take any concern at the presence of Brian, until he saw Drake and Brian get closer and closer, and Brian start to act inappropriately, and he started to get concerned. He went around on set and tried to ask around about Brian and talk about how he felt kind of uncomfortable with how touchy-feely he was and how close he seemed to be to Drake and all these things, but pretty much everyone on set told him that he was being ridiculous, everyone knew Brian, he was gay, so people thought he was maybe being homophobic, and in fact Brian Peck was such a popular person on set that he even had a cameo character on The Amanda Show named Pickle Boy, who was a character that would go around with a big tray of pickles, kind of bragging about how much he loves touching and feeling pickles. Drake's parents were divorced, and eventually Brian was able to manipulate not just Drake, but Drake's mother into fully cutting Drake's father out of his life. From then on out, Brian would essentially become Drake's new manager, taking him around to auditions and having him sleep over at Brian's house. This was until one day, when for the first time, Brian Peck sexually assaulted Drake Bell. Afterwards, Drake was overcome with guilt and embarrassment and shame, and he felt he couldn't tell anyone. And he also couldn't remove Brian from his life because that might tip off people that this thing had happened. And so the status quo continued, and Drake was continuously raped and abused by Brian Peck 
until Drake finally broke down and told his mother the truth. Soon, the law came down on Brian for his repeated sexual abuse of a minor. Brian Peck's abuse did hit the news, but Bell was kept anonymous, and very few people in his circle knew what had happened. One exception to this was Dan Schneider, who immediately became guilty that this had been allowed to happen on one of his sets. He told Drake that he didn't need to talk about it if he didn't want to, but that Dan was willing to be there for him if he ever needed anything. At Brian Peck's trial, countless crew members and celebrities wrote letters in support of Brian Peck, many insinuating that the only way this could have happened was if Drake Bell seduced Brian. Some even arrived in person to give statements in support of Brian and against Drake Bell. Dan Schneider was one of the few prominent people in the industry that stood by Drake Bell and helped him and his mother in their court case. After the trial, Brian Peck served only 16 months in jail. After being released, he registered as a sex offender and then was almost immediately hired to work on the Disney Channel series The Sweet Life of Zack and Cody. Finding ultimate judgment for who is to blame in cases like this can be hard. I do not think that Dan Schneider is responsible in any major way for what happened to Drake Bell. Brian Peck was hired by Tall and Robbins Productions, Dan Schneider had no role in the hiring process, and Brian Robbins was not a registered sex offender when he was hired to work on these shows. But I think it again speaks to this idea that when you're in a situation where you are in charge of a group of kids, there are certain unique responsibilities that should be expected of you, which you would not have on a regular production. And one of those things is being able to recognize those red flags of potential abuse. If you're going after women in your writer's room because they harsh the vibe or because you think they're reporting you to the Writers Guild of America, then I don't think it's an unreasonable expectation that you're kind of paying attention to what the men on your set are getting up to and kind of how they're acting and how they're interacting with some of these kids. But I do also think that if it were a teacher or a principal or a counselor who had missed some of these red flags, I would not give them a lifetime judgment for that mistake. But what these stories certainly represent is that all of this matches very closely with that classic Nickelodeon standard of move fast, break things, and apologize 20 years later. There are two other things I wanna talk about really quickly on this subject. The first is that I've had a lot of people try to pitch to me ways where you could read Dan Schneider's actions in this situation as like secretly malicious, like it was an example of his misogyny or his special treatment of his special stars, but the thing is, I think it's kind of a strange ordeal to want to believe that every single action Dan ever made in his entire life was secretly evil. Because I think the narrative you spin when you go down that path is that if Dan Schneider ever did anything good or nice or justifiable, that forgives the other stuff. And it absolutely doesn't. Just because Dan Schneider did the right thing in the Drake Bell case doesn't mean he doesn't deserve any criticism for all the other stuff we've talked about in this video. And the other thing I want to talk about is that it is so very obvious to me that the Quiet On Set documentary by Investigation Discovery absolutely lets Drake Bell off the hook when it comes to his own misconduct with minors. The cycle of abuse is a real thing and it is tragic in a big way, but when Drake Bell was sexting 15 year olds, he was in his damn 30s, okay? So he is absolutely responsible for his actions. And I think it's a little too soon when he's, when he goes to trial and is sentenced, what, three years ago? That now everybody magically thinks that that didn't happen. And the reason that the Quiet On Set documentary doesn't really go down that path or look at that angle is ironically the same bias that I think affects how a lot of the people that worked with Dan Schneider kind of look at this stuff which is that basically, if Drake Bell hadn't worked with the Quiet On Set documentary crew, they wouldn't have a finished documentary. I think the first uh, the first episode of that documentary 
and even parts of the final episode are so very clearly stitched together and like missing stuff and if they didn't have the Drake Bell interviews, it would be an absolute mess of a documentary. So they don't want to criticize Drake Bell for his own actions. And I think that's the same reason a lot of people in the industry privately don't have a problem with Dan Schneider. It's because, you know, despite the rough times, they owe him something, you know. He's responsible for something they have in their lives, whether that's a good writing job or just the happy memories or being able to watch these old shows. And, you know, it's just ironic to me that that same bias of not wanting to go after this guy that that you feel like you kind of owe to some extent is very clearly present in the Quiet and On Set documentary. Because I fully believe that not only does Drake Bell deserve to be criticized for what he got caught doing, not even what he did, what he got caught doing, not only does he deserve to be criticized for that, in some cases he deserves to be made fun of it, and I don't regret making jokes about it, because this is a man in his 30s sexting 15-year-olds. It's not something you just sweep under the rug with a 30-second quote. To quickly get his caught back up to the present, in 2014, Dan Schneider was allegedly investigated for allegations of the onset atmosphere on the show Sam and Cat. Because of Nickelodeon's findings and overall hesitancy about him, he was allegedly forced to no longer interact with his stars, now directing the series from a booth outside of the set and having people rush his orders back and forth between takes. This took the hours of filming on Sam and Cat from around 13 hours to more like 17 hours, and that's in a single day of filming. When Sam and Cat ended, several of the leads on the show were allegedly offered payouts if they agreed to never speak about, in specifics, the on-set atmosphere on that show. After 2014, photos of Schneider's on-set working on these shows are either extremely rare or non-existent. In 2018, rumors and allegations of Schneider committing sexual misconduct against his stars alongside complaints of people on set triggered another investigation. No evidence was found of the alleged sexual misconduct with his stars, but evidence of emotional abuse was found. After this, Schneider and the network went their separate ways, and he has never worked on television since. It is generally accepted that Schneider's current contract was broken by the network during this exchange, and he walked around with a final payout of about seven million dollars. I know for a fact that there's going to be people that misunderstand certain parts of this video, and I'm even anticipating that there's going to be certain parts that are going to be clipped and taken out of context and posted on social media by really upset people. So I feel I have to be absolutely direct and clear about this. I think a lot of videos about Dan Schneider set out with the goal of proving that Schneider did stuff that was bad enough that he should be in prison right now and forever. I've always felt this is kind of a really steep hill to try and climb, which probably affects how a lot of people cover certain bits of information. So for me, my only goal over the last three years has been to try and prove that not only was it justified to fire Dan Schneider in 2018, he arguably should have been fired far before then. And at this point, unless hell freezes over or the Daily Wire has a really stupid idea, Dan Schneider will never work in television again. I think this is for the best. Dan Schneider needs to go back to working in television like Drake Bell needs to go back to touring high schools around the country with his band. Part 5. Why This All Matters When I first started rewatching iCarly all those years ago for this series, one of the first takes that I came up with was so immediately controversial with everyone around me that I knew I had to hold on to it until this video. So here it is. This is my take. I think that Spencer Shea is a Dan Schneider stand-in. When I first told this theory to people in my circle, I got immediate backlash. And the reason is simple. Spencer is everyone's brother. He's the coolest possible materialization of what a father figure should be. How 
dare you insinuate that he has anything to do with Dan Schneider? But of course, he has something to do with Dan Schneider. He was created by Dan Schneider. He is Dan Schneider. Think about it. Who is Spencer? Well, he's an artist. He's a creative. But he's rejected from the circles of other adult creatives. And so with whom does he bide his time? Well, with the young creatives, the little kids who are so serious about their craft that they have decided that they are essentially the honorary adults in the room. And so Spencer has decided that he is fine with becoming the honorary cool kid. And so he spends all of his time fraternizing with the honorary adults. And he comforts them and he tells them, hey, you're like me and I'm like you. And when you look at these scenes, sometimes it doesn't seem like things are okay. Sometimes these kids are in explicit danger because of Spencer's impulsivity. And other times, there's not really any evidence that anything super bad is happening. But does that really make it all okay? And when you watch scenes like this... I know you have a crush on me. What? Nothing. <laughs> we can easily rationalize that technically Spencer hasn't done anything illegal in that situation. But shouldn't we expect him to be better anyways? Another example I came up with on a much more minor scale is Helen from Drake and Josh. In one of Helen's most memorable episodes, it turns out that when she was younger, she was the star of a sitcom for teenagers, and she forces some of the other characters to watch episodes of the show and see her youthful performances, which is the same backstory as Dan Schneider in the real world. This one really got people upset and there was this overwhelming feeling of, oh, don't take Helen from me. I found this phenomenon fascinating and it's one of the main things that inspired me to really study how people interact with these shows and the kind of discourse that you can see online. And this is why I created the running joke of Dan Schneider not existing. I was trying to make commentary on the way so many people insist upon not crediting him for his work when it's something they're sentimental about, when it's something like Spencer or Helen or Sako or anything else. When you look at those characters, people want to believe that they exist in a vacuum and they have no origin. Now, the sad reality is that uh, some of these videos eventually became so popular that a lot of people online think that I single-handedly invented all discourse about these shows, and thus they assume that my own self-censorship didn't have a point at all, ever. Which is really fun. It's really fun when you spend eight months working on a video that has like a very direct point, and then thousands of people who didn't watch the video accuse you of not having a point, and then people in your audience defend you by saying, well, yeah, he doesn't have a point, but his videos are funny and I fall asleep to them. Thank you. I'm, I'm so happy that's your defense of me. So to hammer home what my point was, I was never saying that it is good to just pretend that Dan Schneider doesn't exist. I was trying to hammer home the ridiculousness of this mentality. And how not only is it fruitless to try and watch shows like iCarly without thinking about the series creator, the further you get down the timeline of these shows, the more his presence is felt, even if you don't say his name. And the big thing that I always thought was the most fascinating thing is that so many people want to maintain their relationships with these shows. Yes, they want to culturally indict Dan Schneider. But once they're done with that, they want to go right back to making memes about Butter Socks and Rex the Puppet. Because when you give Dan Schneider credit for something you don't like, you dismiss the issue. You go, oh, phew, well that's Dan Schneider for you. Huh. But when you give Dan Schneider credit for something you enjoy, you revoke your ability to like that thing. You revoke your ability to like Spencer or Helen or anyone else from these shows. And I guess the big conversation we have to have is, 
is this wrong? And the thing is, I went into this series with a pre-decided answer to that question. I opened up a Google Doc uh, during one of my first writing sessions, and it was, you know, a draft of the script for this video. And there was a long segment in that script that was all about this idea that it is wrong to try and enjoy these shows after we find out stuff like this. It is wrong to enjoy iCarly after we know about Dan Schneider. It's wrong to enjoy Ren and Stimpy after we know about John Kay. Oh, what next? Are we going to reboot Lil Bill? How about that, Nickelodeon? Are we going to get a new season of Lil Bill? But as time passed, two big things happened. First of all, I think I became a little bit less pretentious. And second of all, you know, like I've said, I got sucked into the gravitational pull of this collapsing star. And I don't know what the hell the right answer is anymore. I mean, there were times working on this miniseries where I got especially depressed and I would sometimes go on walks and I would fantasize about how fun it would be to work on a Victorious movie or to pitch an episode of the iCarly reboot. And it is true that the main recurring theme of this miniseries was supposed to be cognitive dissonance and kind of the weirdness of how we look at pop culture. But that doesn't mean that I didn't have fun, you know, playing the Victorious games or filming all those crazy pinboard segments. So truthfully, I don't think I can tell you in good faith that you are never allowed to enjoy any of these shows ever again. But I guess the point I still want to make in this segment is, isn't it weird? Isn't it strange? Isn't it odd to only drag this guy out when there's something you don't like about his work? And to act like the characters that Dan created deserve protection more than the kids who played them. Part 6. Why do we need an iCarly reboot? So this has been kind of the second underlining running thing in this miniseries, and I think it's best to, um, to tackle it here because it's very relevant. When I first started working on this series, Dan Schneider had been fired from Nickelodeon just two years before. And I had started to feel this was having a massive effect on the ongoing legacy of all of these shows. And so I wanted to make a series of videos kind of deconstructing that and eventually ending up here. But then, right after I started working on all this, they announced an iCarly reboot. And I thought to myself... Why? Why? To me, I always thought that Dan getting fired was a very thorough, thematic end to his work, to his material. So now this new thing existing was a massive wrench in the works in terms of illustrating that thesis statement. But I was alone in this because everybody got excited and it seemed like everybody wanted more iCarly. And that was one of the big things that made me realize that I was not on the same page about this topic as everybody else. And I have constantly asked myself this question. Why was the specific moment where I decided to make a series of videos analyzing the downfall of Dan Schneider, the exact same moment where they rebooted his most popular work? And it was only in the last six months that I finally came up with an answer that I think makes sense, at least to me. And that is that to some extent, I am wrong to say that 100% of the legacy of these shows should go to Dan Schneider. Because that is very dismissive of some of the younger people who have had to live with the reality of these brands being their life story. For instance, if you're going to credit one person with the legacy of Good Burger, it probably should be Kel Mitchell. Because sure, he didn't write the original sketch, he didn't write the movie, he didn't work on any of these adaptations, but, you know, it's Kel Mitchell. He's the reason that the material works. And that's a reality that he has to live with when he goes out on the street and random people start talking to him. 
So I think that he has every right in the world to reclaim that character and keep using him. And to some extent, I think the kids from iCarly are the kids from iCarly, and there's nothing they can really do to change that, at least for most of them. I think for them, the iCarly reboot was probably a chance to say, this is what our lives are going to be, whether we like that or not. This brand, this show, iCarly. But at least we should be given a chance to reclaim the brand, reclaim our lives, and make this something worth being known for. And I think when you look at it that way, not only does it make sense, but the same can probably be said for a lot of you. The reason that shows like iCarly and Victorious were so successful was because you were there. You are the sole reason that those shows made it in the first place. And I think at the end of the day, the way that you consume media is kind of your own business. But all I hope is that in the future, when you're thinking about some of these shows, you sometimes just really quickly think to yourself, was it worth it? Was the the hurt that so many of these kids went through, was it worth it so that you could be entertained? And I think just asking yourself that question will do a lot in establishing where we need to go from here. Part 7. Dan Schneider, The Fall Guy. So this is probably going to be the part of the video that people misconstrue the easiest. So I apologize if I have to kind of over-explain what I'm going for here. When I say the phrase, Dan Schneider, The Fall Guy, a lot of you are probably anticipating that my thesis statement is going to be that when Dan Schneider was fired from Nickelodeon, it meant that other people who were complicit in a lot of these problems got away scot-free. That's a very interesting topic, and for legal reasons I'm going to speculate on it no further. The bigger topic that I want to talk about is the phenomenon of Dan Schneider as a cultural fall guy. And to explain this, I am now going to repeat a quote that I have seen online verbatim so many times that it's not even funny. And this is the quote. Dan Schneider is single-handedly responsible for everything that went wrong in Amanda Bynes' life. Is he, though? Or is it just an easier conversation if we blame one semi-retired guy for everything instead of talking about the cultural system that consistently trades in the mental health of children for millions of dollars? The thing that always bothers me when we talk about former child stars with traumatic backstories is that we always talk about them like they're dead, like they're not going around giving interviews and hosting podcasts, and it like strips them of their autonomy in a way that I find just really irritating. But the reason it bothers me so much when people have these reductive 280 character takes is not because I want to defend Dan Schneider. It's because when you blame one guy or one network, you ignore a much bigger problem that is still an ongoing issue. I'll give you another example. So the show Ned's Declassified School Survival Guide, there's a podcast now hosted by the original stars of that show. And Lindsay Shaw has often talked about stories on that podcast, which are kind of just things that she did and happened to her in Hollywood that are kind of suspicious and really weird. And I often see these clips go viral, and then I see people respond, Ugh, that's Dan Schneider for you. But he didn't even work on that show. So why is your brain hardwired to bring him up every time something like this happens? The answer is that people enjoy giving 100% of the blame for everything to Dan Schneider, because then they can think, well, Nickelodeon fired him, he doesn't work in television anymore, 
So now there are no problems with child stars in Hollywood. Because it was all one fucking guy. Just think, if we can find some way to blame Dan Schneider on Lindsay Lohan and Britney Spears, there's so many complicated things that we won't have to think about anymore! Because this is the big thing that sticks out to me about this topic. If Brian Robbins had never pulled Dan over to work on all that, and Dan had just remained an obscure former sitcom star, Nickelodeon would have found another producer to make 40 some odd episodes of live action kids content a year. They would have found another producer to push the limits of labor laws to get more and more stuff done. They would have found another producer to sexualize female teenage stars in the 2010s to boost their ratings. And here's the big question. If Jeanette McCurdy had been cast on a Disney Channel show, would she have had a happy childhood? What about Amanda Bynes? If you swap out Dan Schneider with any big name Disney Channel producer, is everything in her life suddenly fine? At the very least, when Brian Peck was outed, arrested, and sentenced for sexual abuse with a minor, Nickelodeon didn't just rehire him, unlike the fucking Disney Channel over here. And if you think that every single thing that happened in this video only happened because of Dan Schneider, congratulations on the very sound sleep you are going to have tonight. Because Dan Schneider is gone, and now there is no work left to be done. But the reality that I live in is that this conversation does not start or end with Dan Schneider. There is a culpability much more broad than that. And if we go out from here and we say that this is all in the past, then the industry will simply turn around and create a new Dan Schneider. And personally, I don't want to be standing here in 38 years having this exact same conversation. On May the 12th, 2020, it was officially announced that Head of the Class would return for a modern reboot, with Jeff Ingold and Bill Lawrence serving as executive producers and former Zack and Cody star Phil Lewis directing most of the material. All 10 episodes of the series would premiere on HBO Max on November the 4th, 2021. The series features a similar premise to the original. Isabella Gomez stars as Miss Alicia Gomez, a new teacher at Meadows Creek High School who begins instructing the honors debate class. Just like the original series, Head of the Class 2021 stakes much of its material on highbrow humor, derived from history, politics, and philosophy. Oh, you look like Pickle Rick. Only one actor from the original series returned for the production, as in episode 2, it is revealed that Terrell's mother is Darlene, a classmate of the original series played by Robin Givens in both incarnations, although in the reboot she only has the most fleeting of cameos. 43 days after premiering, with almost no publicity of any kind promoting the series, HBO announced that it would not be moving forwards with a second season. 
One year after that, the series was deleted from HBO Max. On occasion, the odd episode of the show might broadcast on Tubi or the Roku channel. But without some level of extreme forward thinking, there is no longer a legal way to watch Head of the Class 2021. While the original series was given years to build momentum and become a cult classic that would launch the careers of countless people, the reboot would only be allowed to exist for 13 months before being written off, perhaps literally. With this, we enter a new age of television, where entertainment companies are run like Silicon Valley startups, operating at a loss for decades while media is meant to have value for the second screen before the first where growth matters more than performance, and reboots are greenlit based on name recognition alone, and then are shuttered away without pause for the effect that this has on the consumer. So, are you ready for the future? Because I'll tell you one thing. I'm not.